You are listening to a song from the first ever album where both the lyrics and the vocal melodies were created with an AI based system. With this, it is clear that AI's ability to disrupt and change industries doesn't stop with music and art. And in today's show, we will take a look at the question, if AI produces a valuable piece of art, how is ownership of the piece decided? Hi, I'm Sam Breakgear and welcome to Brains Bite Back the podcast looking at the overlap between psychology and modern technology. Joining me on today's show is an attorney whose practice focuses on the meeting place between art and technology, and his clients have included an AI music composition software company and other art-focused startups. His practice includes intellectual property, media and entertainment, and startups. He is also a partner of Cullen Meadows law firm, Seku Campbell. In addition to Seiku, we are also joined by an expert on AI and computational creativity. She is the CEO and co-founder of Wave AI that allows anyone to create original songs in minutes using its AI-based tool, Alicia. She is also an invited speaker at the United Nations, Google, IBM Research, Stanford University, to name a few. Maya Ackerman, enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by Publicize, a digital PR company that grows businesses' online presence. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brains Bite Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. Would you both be able to introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about um, who you are and what you do in the space of art and technology? Uh, Maya, if you want to go first, then Seku afterwards. Absolutely. Um, I'm Maya Ackerman. I'm a professor at Santa Clara University in the computer science and engineering department, uh, as well as CEO and co-founder of Wave AI. And um, at Wave AI, we focus on democratizing creative expressions through songwriting. In general, my area of focus is artificial intelligence with a focus on computational creativity and machine learning. And what I'm most interested in is really that creative collaboration between humans and AI, where the AI supports human creativity. Hi, I'm Seku Campbell. I'm a partner at Colhane Meadows PLLC. It is a virtual law firm, most well-recognized for tech. My specific practice areas um, intersect both with tech companies. Uh, I do their corporate work, deal-making, things like that. Um, as well as traditional entertainment deals. Um, So I kind of work in the intersection between art and tech. Um, And I also have some clients in the nonprofit art world as well. Extracurricularly, I'm also a professor and adjunct in legal writing at Lincoln University. And I'm chair, co-chair of the Black Star Film Festival in Philadelphia. Awesome. Excellent. And thank you so much for joining me both of you today, because I really think that I couldn't have picked uh, two better guests. And it's a real balance of perspectives in this case. I first came across this kind of topic of understanding what would happen if AI produced a piece of art in an article that I read. And it really made me question this whole process. I'm sure the answer is very simple. And hopefully you will, you both will have the answers and I'll end up realizing that it's far more simple than than I first anticipated but when I was posed the question like if AI produces a piece of art who owns it that really baffled me so I knew that I had to do an episode on this and I would love to start the show off by getting both of your opinions on how this works and I know it can potentially be complicated to explain who owns it if there's not a specific case or there's not a specific example we're talking about and we're talking about a more kind of general sense but I'd really be interested to know both of your opinions from your work in this field and obviously the, the work that you do, Maya. Seiko, would you be able to tell us, like from a legal perspective, if AI produces a piece of art, who owns the overall piece of art that is produced in, in your opinion from what you know? Sure. I think I'm going to disappoint you. <laughs> the answer is definitely not simple um, because there's just there's simply no precedent at the moment. 
different countries. Uh, the EU has looked at this. Japan has looked at this. And the United States currently, I mean, the best sort of indication that we have is from the U.S. Copyright Office in their compendium, um, which is a several thousand page document that the U.S. Copyright Office publishes. And it focuses on a human authored work. Um, so there's at least an indication, a hint that at least the U.S. Copyright Office, which is not a lawmaking body, thinks that only work that is authored by humans is copyrightable. And let me sort of take a step back. The copyright itself, which is the law primarily that is at issue in this, in this field of AI-created works, it is born out of technology. It, it was created because of the printing press, um, which was the technology at that time, <laughs> <laughs> um, and has gone through iterations through every single major technological advancement from radio to television to the internet. There have been huge changes in the way copyright law is interpreted and, and looked at. So that's the hint that we have, but there are a lot of folks who could really make really good arguments for why that that's not necessarily going to be the, the, the law of the land. Um, first of all, the whole work made for hire doctrine. So there's a there's a, a way that works can be authored by corporations. And that's known as the work made for hire doctrine. So if you read a newspaper, if you watch a movie, most of those are done through what are called work made for hires, although the original content was technically authored by a human, whatever that was, would be in an article or the cinematography in a film, et cetera. The fact is, is that the, the law treats the owner as the original author, and that would be a corporate body. So there's been a lot of discussion in scholarship about the owner of the technology, the company that owns the technology being the author of the AI. That's a very popular sort of position to take. But again, that's not, you know, there's no precedent. There's no case that we can point to and say, aha, that's, that's what it is. The other sort of thing I would mention is just in general, uh, an approach or two approaches that courts typically take when they look at copyrights. One I, I would call is by analogy to brick and mortar. And the other is what I would call under the hood, right? So they look at exactly technically what is actually happening. And if you take an under the hood approach, then it's unlikely that AI would get, AI created works would get any kind of copyright protection. But if you take a, an analogy approach, which has been largely the approach, although there are exceptions to this, of analyses in copyright, generally they look at an analogy. So they don't look at specifically what's happening technically, but they'll look generally at, okay, what does this most look like in the world today? Um, and I think in that case, you'd have a really good argument that the work made for higher doctrine is very similar to an AI created work owned by a corporation, right? So I think, you know, generally speaking, that's kind of the, the landscape, but there's no sort of answer at this point. There's no, Supreme, <laughs> certainly no Supreme Court precedent. And as far as I know, there's no even lower court decision on this topic. So yeah, just as, as complex as I thought it would be. And Maya, would you be able to explain a bit about how your business works and how yeah, ownership operates within your business? Or to what extent AI is praised or awarded? How does it work for your business? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I'm, um, I come from academia. So from a hypothetical point of view, there's a lot of options. But then, of course, when we have business and we have a product that we want people to enjoy, we had to make decisions about how to proceed. And we have two products out right now, and we actually made a different decision for each one of them. So for example, we have a professional AI-based system that helps professionals create original lyrics. So it generates original lyrical lines based on the person's style and the topics that they want to write about. And for that product, we decided that for the flat fee that the user pays per month, they then own the copyright for the lyrics that they create. So it makes it very simple, makes it appealing to professionals who need, who ultimately need the copyright. So the business model is sort of uncomplicated for ownership. Anything that they create, they by default own. 
On the other hand, with Alicia, it, it's it's pretty close to that. We weren't able to offer quite the same amount of flexibility, but they can buy the rights to use the songs that they create. Uh, that's an app, by the way, that's targeted more broadly. It uh, allows anybody to create songs. So we have a lot of people who are not songwriters, who are not professional musicians, and people who really make songs because it's fun, because it's enjoyable, because it's socially shareable. So the need for ownership of that is not quite as strong as for Lyric Studio. And so we still have an easy way to get full ownership for the person. Uh, it's a simple fee. It's a simple one-time fee, and it's affordable. Uh, so we kind of settled on a different solution there that seemed more appropriate. So instead of having everybody pay as if they're going to own it, we, we allowed more flexibility so we can make it cheaper, actually free for a lot of our users. I was going to say, uh, what was the motivation to choose those different approaches for the two different technologies there? It, it was really the target market. So with Alicia, we wanted to make it so that the world can write songs. There's a lot of psychological benefits, especially right now during COVID-19. We see a lot of our users write about how difficult these processes are, uh, these, um, these experiences are. And um, there is actually a lot of research showing the psychological benefits of songwriting. So we wanted to, to make a free tier for that. And because we have human songwriters, human producers, create some of the material on Alicia, so the background tracks are human made, we couldn't give away the rights to it for free. But mm. we could let people create it and socially share it for free. So we're really doing the best that we can given the circumstances for our users and their needs. And then if somebody wants commercial rights, right now you pay $25 and you get commercial rights. So it's, it's really quite simple. But with Lyric Studio, the default use case is that a person is creating lyrics for a song that they want to own and publish. So in that context, there is no purpose in making the differentiation because we expect most of our users to need the rights. And so we designed the business model so that with your monthly subscription, you own the rights to anything that you create. So it's really very user-centered, depending on what the user needs and how we can make it most affordable for the user. So and I do really like the idea of your intention there of like giving something to the world and not necessarily like immediately saying like you don't get ownership of this or not having that professional focus and making it more something that everyone can enjoy. So I appreciate that. And Seiku, I'd be interested to know out of curiosity, like from what you just said, have you worked on any cases before which come to mind where there has been a complicated issue of like ownership due to AI and ownership and any kind of dispute there? Well, I should have mentioned this in my introduction. I actually also work for Maya and <laughs> Wave AI. Um, so I've worked on their, their agreements. One thing I want to note to historically, just to add on to, to what Maya is saying, but I will, I will answer your question, is that, um, as I mentioned, so all the new technologies, radio, television, film, they all kind of went through this stage and it's really actually exciting to get to work with Wave AI to see how, as, Mo, as Maya mentioned, they're focused on marketability of both the technology and the, the end product. And I think, you know, with that focus, if you look throughout history, there have been some recent story, recent news stories about how some of the old sort of original uh, arrangements that happen in music uh, with decrees, and they, a lot of them are governed by decrees, are starting to change. So ASCAP and BMI are looking at changing their decrees. The film industry had a long-standing decree relative to theater, theater houses themselves that are that's about to change. So just to see how the sort of law gets created, at least in this industry, first through the market, and then once we figure out arrangements that kind of make sense and, and allow for a good transfer of rights and the ability for an audience to enjoy the, the end product as well as everyone getting, you know, sort of their fair share, I think that's kind of where we are, certainly with Wave AI. And I think the industry is in general. And so to, your, to, to answer your question, and this is sort of fairly typical in the entertainment industry, you don't typically see, and I haven't been a part of any like actual disputes, at least ones that look like they were headed for litigation. Often these things kind of get worked out to where both parties kind of find a space that's reasonable and that they can sort of both live with or all live with. 
Um, and so that's kind of the stage we're in now. It is certainly possible that at some point, you know, if someone, for example, creates an AI created piece that charts, for example, that could be something that down the line could lead to a dispute, right? Because then you're talking about a significant sum of money for one single product. But I haven't really seen that. There are certainly deals among var- all stakeholders um, in various industries. And I think the thing anyone in tech should be thinking about when you're thinking about AI in the entertainment space is how do you deal with the big stakeholders, right? What is their role going to be in your work because at some point I call, I analogize them to like investment banks, right? Like they hold massive amounts of, of copyright just in general. And so they have a huge influence on the market. And so whenever you're sort of entering that market, you have to think about what is your relationship going to be with those and, and are the arrangements you're making now going to make sense as you move into the market with those bigger copyright holders, be it film, music, television, et cetera. I was interested in what you said specifically to the start, because you mentioned about how this is an interesting time, or at least a time where things are growing and things are certainly changing and evolving in the sense of this path is like currently being developed. And I see that so, I think that's such a frequent occurrence in technology in the sense that every episode I have, whenever there's some kind of ambiguity surrounding how things are going to work or how things function. It's always a case that technology evolves and then the law and processes surrounding it kind of try and keep up or evolve around it. Yep. And from the sounds of things, it sounds like um, art and technology is no different in this case. No, I, the only thing that's unique, I think, in this field is that very often they remain unlitigated. I mean, there are things in entertainment that sort of just never get worked out because even if something someone files a suit, usually even those cases wind up settling <laughs> fairly yeah. early on. And so and they're private, they're confidential. So, you know, a lot of times those things are sort of just practice, right? They're just industry standards. There's no sort of law governing them. It's good to know that there's no real solid disputes. I was thinking beforehand potentially it could be quite aggressive because I know that people and humankind like naturally can be somewhat possessive so then in a situation like this where it's not exactly clear and there's no clear-cut answer to who owns what potentially then I was under the assumption that things might get ugly but it's, it's reassuring to hear that that well I don't know if it's a case of uh, things being set up well and uh, legally and just everything's all in all ship shape or if people are generally more benevolent than I anticipate them to be. <laughs> I hope it's the latter. <laughs> but it's probably a mixture of both, to be honest. On a slightly different note, and getting a bit more kind of philosophical, and it's hard to answer, I don't think there's an answer for this question, but I find it really interesting that art is getting involved, or tech is getting involved with art, in the sense that the two disciplines somewhat are considered quite separate. Like when you think of someone that, is very tech focused you don't necessarily assume that they're art focused and when someone's very art focused you might not assume that they're particularly tech focused and uh, Maya I was really interested in your background since that you have a PhD in computer science and you've been involved in like the United Nations and Google and IBM research and yet you're like the CEO of a, a very art focused company so I think that you're quite a a rare guest or a rare person in that sense. Would you consider yourself like more art or more tech focused? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's hard. It's like you said, pick, picking between your right or left arm. Uh, there is actually quite a bit of research showing that, especially with mathematics, there is a high correlation between playing music and being, uh, and being a mathematician. And especially when you look at Nobel Prize winners, kind of people who really really, really succeeded in their field, the correlation becomes very, very strong. So a lot of people who succeed in STEM um, have an arts background. To be honest, I don't believe in this really harsh separation between disciplines. I think knowledge is more fluid. I think there's a lot more interplay between different disciplines than sort of traditional schooling allows for. And I actually believe that our society 
is hyper specialized. We're not machines. We're not meant to do one thing. And so for me, it's just about being human, you know, having, having multiple, multiple interests and I think the most interesting stuff is often find, found in the intersection of different dis disciplines. Can I just second that? Certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, Go ahead. I, I, I grew up in a house with a physicist and an art historian as a father and mother. <laughs> and I agree with Maya. I think the process of discovery and of, of rigor is really similar in both the arts and in science. There are breakthroughs. There are, <laughs> you know, you hit, hit your wall. There are theories that you think will work that don't. And you see it actually in the industry. Certainly the large companies are all very much in the art and entertainment world, be it Google with YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. I mean, they're all, well, Facebook is Instagram, but the, mm -hmm. all the major tech companies are Apple certainly are in not just the distribution and, and presentation of content, but the creation of content. And I don't think that's simply a money move. I think there is a high correlation between those who are talented in science and, and, and in art, and there's a lot of crossover. Yeah, actually, um, apparently there is some research, research showing that women who go into STEM tend to have different interests. They tend to be good at sort of the humanities as well, which is interesting. Um, I don't know if that's culturally specific. I do actually think that now that we've discussed it, I see that curiosity and I suppose creativity are two things which I can recognize in both people of a, a more academic background in like mathematics or technology and art, because at the same time, I think there's a, a case of problem solving. And even though it's not the same kind of problem solving, where obviously if you've got a mathematical equation, that's more of a literal problem. Whereas if you have like something more artistic, like that's more of a personal problem. It's almost like you're trying to put the creativity you have inside you onto something on like a page or in like a musical form. So I suppose it's still the process of getting from A to B and trying to be creative in between getting from that A to B. I would love to know, though, how do you think that this is going to affect traditional artists? The more technology becomes involved in art, how are traditional artists going to be impacted by this? Do you think that they're going to be uh, overshadowed or do you think that they're going to have to learn to work with technology more i'd just be interested to know what like uh, you think about this maya and then maybe say you could uh, add your thoughts afterwards so that's that's a really important question and one that my academic community and computational creativity considers very seriously there's so many different perspectives so one perspective says okay so let's say we have and now one more computer artist so there are there are systems that autonomously create art there's for example the painting fool there was a system called Aaron. Uh, that's, a little, that's the original automated painter. And they automatically create art to various degrees. And that hasn't had any impact on the art world. <laughs> Definitely not a lot more so than having one more human painter. So th there's definitely something to question about this assumption that if we have machines autonomously create art, does that somehow necessarily take away from humans any more than having one more, one more human artist? So that's, there is some legitimacy about this perspective. It definitely asks the right questions. Like, why are we so threatened by a machine artist? It's not like, it's not like, um, like a machine that can make computers, right? Where it can suddenly just make all the computers. It's art is subjective and there is an element of style. It's just because there is a, a machine that creates art doesn't mean that everybody's gonna suddenly flock to the art that that machine creates. Um, nevertheless, despite this perspective, I think, the future of art is in part determined by how we choose to use the technology. So you can have a very, if you will, talented machine artist, and you can choose to gear it towards creating autonomously, or you can choose to gear it towards collaborating with humans. And even when it collaborates with humans, you still have a lot of choices. Do we want it to do most of the work and the human to just give some really simple input so that human can have fun? Or do we want to make it sort of a teacher where gradually the person gets better and better in the art by collaborating with the machine? Do we want it to be more of an equal partnership? Do we want the human to use the machine and as much as they need to, to finish what they're trying to do? So there are all these different options. And I personally really believe in using AI to help people be more creative. I struggled with songwriting for a very long time and actually originally created this technology together with my team 
in order to be able to be creative as a person. That was always kind of my personal goal. And when we release a technology, the goal is to make it so more people can participate in a specific art, in our case, songwriting. And that's where I think a lot of the potential is. And that's where I think sort of one of the best applications for humanity lies, helping people be more creative in a very authentic, real sense even if that makes them more independent from the technology over time. But that doesn't mean necessarily that people who want to do autonomous creation with AI are necessarily doing anything wrong. Uh, but I think they really need to think it through, to think where does that technology fit within society and how is it going to impact people? I think it's a non-trivial question. It's a very important question and one that both researchers and academics need to be asking themselves as they develop new technology. Yeah. Sergey, would you like to, to share your thoughts too? Sure. I, I think, so again, I would, I would go back to history and note that technology has been around for a long time and has seen, we've seen it only proliferate humans making art. I, I've not seen an example in history of a technology that replaces artists. And I think that is a, at least a voiced fear of AI in general and perhaps in this space. And so I agree with basically everything, <laughs> everything that Maya said. One thing I would note that I think is a challenge with this technology that's distinct from all prior ones is the fact that, you know, I'll use an example, like, I don't know how my car works, but it works and I can use mm -hmm. it, right? But the inventor of the car knows how it works, right? The people who built it, the people who designed it do. And I think what's unique about AI is, or at least the potential, is that we may not know, even the people who build it may not know exactly how it creates its, its end product. And I'm not sure yet whether that will make a difference. If you're a photographer and you don't know exactly how your, your camera works, but you know how to shoot great photographs, that doesn't seem to matter that much. And I don't know if AI as a tool, in terms of the paradigm that Maya talked about in terms of collaborating with humans, whether or not that will make a difference. And I'm not overly concerned with AI replacing humans creating art. Maybe I should be, but I just, I don't see any evidence throughout human history of that ever being the case that a technology, no matter how powerful, winds up replacing human beings. Yeah, I think we, we forget, we forget how revolutionary previous technologies were. When the acoustic piano was introduced, a lot of musicians were very upset that this is cheating, that this is not really making music. We had the same reaction with guitars, with electric guitars, with synthesizers. And what it actually ended up doing was create new forms of art. Humans take what we give them and use that to go a lot further, to come up with whole new creative domains. And um, the opportunity for that is very high with using artificial intelligence and to some degree has already happened. So it's definitely in many ways, very good for human creativity. And the resistance that we're seeing is a resistance as Seko pointed out that we have seen throughout all of human history without, without having the negative consequences that people feared. Having spoken to both of you and just like the two points you just added, both have really reassured me. I think beforehand I did have an unnecessary concern that maybe AI would become growingly more prevalent in in art. And I suppose the, the actual artist would either become less relevant or lazier. But at the same time, Maya, you mentioning about the piano reminds me of a funny clip from a British TV show by Steve Coogan. And Steve Coogan plays his character and he, he's with a, a young lad who's maybe like 19 and Steve Coogan's character is about 50. And there's a song on the radio and his character is complaining, saying like, what, this isn't music. This is just noise. He's like, back in my day, you had to learn to play a guitar or learn to play an instrument to be an artist. Now all you need is a laptop and some software and you're an artist. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And I think that's that's very representative of like what you just mentioned. And the truth is, is like uh, there's lots of DJs that I love that probably can't even play an instrument, but they can make fantastic music using software and um, the latest technology. And I, I, I'm very happy to have it in the world. So it makes perfect sense what you're saying to me. Truthfully, you have uh, reassured me that everything's going to be all right and that we can <laughs> expect to see a lot more art from technology and thankfully with less disputes than than I thought there would be Seku. <laughs>
<laughs> so far. I mean, we'll we'll see. I mean, like I like I said, the 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 proof will be as you know more and more, frankly, money comes into yeah. play. It's not that there won't be disputes. It's just that I think the sort of ethos in the industry is to keep those deals pretty confidential um, for various reasons, right? I mean, you just don't want your deal points floating, you know, around the world. Um, mm. It's been a challenge in other technology areas too, like blockchain, for example. But I think the disputes will likely be hammered out behind closed doors and, and will simply be folded into some type of industry practice. Or you'll see some type of decree like you see with ASCAP, BMI, those kinds of things. Awesome. Yeah, this has been a really positive episode, which t makes a break from, or at least takes a break from the usual kinds of episodes, because recently I've done a series called The Most Dangerous Countries on the Internet. And then my last call as well was about the future of warfare. So having <laughs> a nice <laughs> chat about tech and art is uh, really reassuring, especially since it was, uh, it was a really nice chat today. Fantastic. So if people want to follow you and keep up to date with what you're doing, um, how can they do that? Do you have social media at all? I do. It's um, underscore Seku underscore uh, and on Twitter. LinkedIn is, you know, search my name. <laughs> I'm probably the only Seku Campbell on LinkedIn. You know, I'm on the Colhane Meadows website. It's just colhanemeadows.com. Excellent. And Maya, yourself, do you have anything uh, on social media or any sites that uh, people can follow to keep up to date with what you're doing? Oh, absolutely. And we have uh, the Wave AI site, which is Wave dash ai.net and that links to all of our products and i also have a pretty active linkedin account myself yeah those are probably the two best points of points of entry fantastic thank you so much for joining me today i've uh, really enjoyed this it's been good yeah thank you very much it was a real pleasure thank you once again thank you to our sponsor publicize visit their website if you want to find out more about their pr for growth packages their free resources or even schedule a call. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brains Bite Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. And we are done. That is our show. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can find more episodes just like this and many articles at sociable.co. You can also follow us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Stitcher, Overcast. There's way too many places to mention where you can find us. So Google us or search on your favorite podcasting site, Brains Bite Back, and you will most certainly find us. You can also reach out and let us know what you thought of this episode at, at The Sociable on Twitter. So don't be shy. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care.